the two questions that usually come up pretty early on are why are the instruments here uh, being in Seattle and why are these instruments here being this particular collection in this room at this time. Uh, so I'll start with that and then give a quick introduction to Parch's tuning system and introduce some of these instruments a little where I was a student and then at this time in 2012 where I was working. And uh, we came out just, it was gonna be one concert that we did at the Mini Main Stage. And in theory, that was going to be the end of it. And then the director uh, of the Parch Ensemble at the time, Dean Drummond, who was one of my mentors, uh, passed away a couple of months later. And shortly after that, um, for a number of reasons, we started looking for a new place for the instruments to go. and. Uh, I remembered pretty well how enthusiastic and, and welcoming the audience was here, and I thought, uh, for better or worse, I passed that information on. And ultimately, uh, this ended up being the place that seemed like it had the best shot at having a community that would support what we're doing. If the institution supports what we're doing, that's great, but it doesn't, I shouldn't say that, but it doesn't really matter as much as having a community and audience that's interested in Parch's music and his aesthetic. Um, otherwise, we do kind of the same five or six concerts for the same 50 or 60 people, and we could do that anywhere. So it was good, and it seems like it's been true in the last few years that there's really been a good audience for this. Uh, why are these particular instruments out? The way that Harry's music has to work, uh, these, uh, this is about a third of the total collection of instruments that he built. and. We have a very small room over in the School of Music for our rehearsal space. It's maybe uh, a fifth or a sixth of the stage space. So all this stuff was crammed into that amount of room. And uh, so the instruments are out because that's what I could fit in the room and make a useful concert out of. Or in the case of this week, uh, three concerts. We have something Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday this week. Uh, different programs featuring different of the instruments and different compositions by Parch and others. Uh, but that's always why these particular instruments are available at any given time, is that I could build a concert around them. Uh, so I'm going to start by playing Parch's Chromelodeon. This is one of the first instruments that he invented. Uh, this is a reed organ, a regular pump organ that, uh, or harmonium that he took all of the reeds out of and replaced with reeds that were tuned to his system. Uh, and at this point, he was playing with a 43 note per octave just in tone scale. So I'll play that really quick. So one sounding octave is three and a half octaves on the keyboard, which means you need two hands to play a triad uh, or a seventh chord or something like that. But uh, how many of you here are non-musicians? A handful. Can, can all of you still hear the difference between, uh, these are the closest two notes, this one and this one? It's still, no one would say it's a huge distance, but it's still an audible difference between them. So one of the misconceptions about a lot of Parch's stuff is that he was trying to play with things people couldn't even hear. Uh, and that's not really the case. What he was trying to do was play with things that were perfectly, perfectly in tune. A just system is all based off mathematical ratios. Um, and if I kind of turn this keyboard out, you can see that each key uh, has two numbers painted on it, right? In this case, 14 over 11, 5 over 4. These are all ratios uh, that tell you how fast does this pitch vibrate compared to a G. He arbitrarily based his system around G, uh, I think because that was about the bottom of his vocal range. So it was easy to make that the tonic. And anyway, when you're building fixed pitch instruments, you just need to choose something to base it around. So his system is all based around G, which is this rainbow key here, uh, which stands for 1-1, one, one, which in his language would mean it vibrates one time for every one time a G vibrates, which of course it would, it's a G. Uh, so the simpler the mathematics on this instrument, the simpler the ratio will sound. Uh, this being on wheels, I can't just play it or it'll run away from me, so I've got to back it up against this other guy. But what we have here, if we look at the ratio 3-2, that's this note here, this vibrates three times every two times a G vibrates, and so we just recognize that as a perfect fifth. Uh, I'll be right with you. 4-3 is another fairly simple ratio. That's our perfect fourth. 
Five over four is a simple ratio, that's our major third. If we get to a ratio that's a little bit weirder looking, like 11 over seven, it's also a little bit weirder sounding of a pitch, right? If you wanted to hear something like that, you would expect this minor sixth instead of this kind of really small minor sixth. Question? Uh, well, he, yeah, had to go down to the organ store and buy probably 10 sets of reeds so that he could fine tune, get the one that fits best in the cell, and then tune it probably 40, 50 cents to make it the right pitch. Uh, yeah, so I have a bag of reeds that probably dates back to the 1930s. I must have 200 reeds that I can put in here because the problem with tuning one of these is it's a half millimeter thick piece of brass and you can only file that so often, uh, so much until it's gone. And then you need to replace it with another one. Yes? So what did you choose as a G, a perfect fit? Uh, so his G is 392 hertz. 392. Yeah, which makes his A441. Uh, so that's the basic gist of the chromolodeon. Since I'm here, a few other interesting things about this instrument. Uh, it has, like any reed organ would, a series of stops that change the reed bank that you're playing on. So uh, he renamed them since this would be equivalent to an eight foot stop, but it doesn't really mean anything on this instrument. So he just calls this the A stop. And then he has a Z stop, which is an octave lower. Uh, he has the X stop, which is an octave higher. But the thing that's interesting for me, um, most reed organs would have a coupler which would play the same key one keyboard octave higher. And again, to kind of swing this thing out, um, you can kind of see that this key up here starts dancing around a little bit when I push this one. So the reed under this is also being activated. On a regular organ, that's just gonna activate a reed one octave higher, but here it activates a reed that's about a minor third higher. So we get this kind of classic Harry Parch sound of things that are in slightly different sized minor thirds as you go up and down the scale. And then the other cool thing about this is this extra keyboard he added down here called the sub bass, which enables you to get these super low tones. So that's a little bit about the chromolodeon. Uh, the next instrument I wanna definitely make sure I get to is the diamond marimba. That is this guy. This is uh, a physical manifestation of the tonality diamond, which is the basic theoretical principle of just intonation. Uh, it's not an invention of Parches, even though he's often credited for it. It showed up about 15 or 20 years before he really started working with just intonation. But what this does is takes just a series of pure just intervals and arranges them into this matrix. So if we start uh, on this pitch, which is our G, we're back to 1-1 one, one here and go in a diagonal line moving up into the right. We go just up the overtone series of G, uh, arranged in thirds. Does everyone follow what I mean so far? Great. Uh, so the overtone series of G, we go, we're going up by thirds. So here's our major third, our perfect fifth, the dominant seventh, a ninth, and eleventh. Uh, going down into the right, we just invert all of these. So this is basically our major. Uh, going down into the right, we invert these. So down the major third, down the perfect fifth, which gives us our minor sound, seventh, ninth, and eleventh. Uh, what's interesting about it is that from there, from each of these six pitches, if you move on the diagonal plane that it lies on, you get that same overtone series. If From all of these, if you move down into the right, you get that same uh, inverse of that series. He calls it an undertone series, which technically is not a real thing, but uh, as a theoretical principle, it's good to have the opposite of all of these overtones. And so what that means as a keyboard instrument is that if you play across one of these rows left to right, the pitches don't appear to go in any particular order because it's all about how they fit into this harmonic matrix. Uh, but again, this is the basic principle of just intonation and for a composer who's trying to figure out this system, and I don't necessarily mean Parch when I say that because he was already well into just intonation by the time he got around to building percussion. Uh, but for a composer who's trying to figure out this system, you can look at any one of these keys, which again, they all have the ratios written on them, and see what tonalities does it fit in just by what rows does it intersect. Yes? How, how, how would one write music for these things? I mean, she, she's music for Each one of his instruments has a unique tablature system that goes along with it. <laughs> This is, this is my job here. Uh, 
the keyboard ones are the best because it looks like keyboard notation. It just doesn't sound like it. Uh, this instrument has, it would fit on a regular, gra um, not grand staff, a regular five line staff with each of the five lines corresponding to one of these five center rows, three ledger lines above and below the staff. And then to choose which bar you're on, uh, he will either write a number above or below the note. If the number's above the note, you're in rightward diagonals. If the number's below the note, you're in leftward diagonals. So it's like doing a Mensa quiz. <laughs> but uh, each one of his instruments has some kind of problem because it's either a layout, in this case a theoretical layout, or a layout just uh, given to practicality, or like in the case of the gourd tree, a layout that he set up just because it looks nice this way. But you need to sort of navigate, tell the player how to navigate that. So everything is just a tablature instead of a uh, information about what pitch is going to sound, except for his earliest, earliest instrument, uh, the adapted viola here, where the notation is ratios only, and you're on your own from there. Uh, <laughs> any other questions about the diamond marimba? Is that affected by humidity, weather? I mean, it's, it Yes, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> despite all his best intentions, he couldn't, there are some things he couldn't defeat. Uh, he made most of his career in, in central and south central uh, California, where at least the weather is fairly predictable. Um, but he also spent a lot of time in central Illinois, where it is not. Uh, and so we deal with it even here, and it was much worse in my studio in New Jersey, uh, the changes in temperature, the changes in the humidity. It affects these marimba keys a little bit. I notice it, but um, I think it's still effective in the context of the orchestra, but it affects the strings and the soundboards quite severely. We tune every instrument every day before rehearsal. There's no other way to work on his music. If the instruments are out of tune, what's the point? Yes? How do you tune? Uh, primarily, we tune to the chrome melodeon, so we'll just give a pitch and then tune the strings to that. And you kind of check the percussion instruments. Mostly, they're close enough. Um, in the case of this huge guy in the corner, which I'll get to in a minute, the marimbo roika, uh, those four bars are new. We had to replace the old ones; they had all cracked. Uh, and that, the lowest one, um, is tuned to 22 hertz. And so you tune that with a little bit of good luck. <laughs> you, we, we played an octave that's like four notes higher, and I was at that thing with a belt sander, and you just grind it down a little bit, and you hope that you don't go too far. Yes? How long does it take to tune everything? Every uh, if we're going to tune all the string instruments we have in here right now, that is five harmonic cannons, two cathars, and the surrogate cathara, the guitars, hour and a half. Uh, and that's because the people who helped me tune have been doing it for a long time, and they're very good at it. Uh, if we had a few people come in here for the first time to tune some of these things, three and a half hours. The, the one challenge is if someone says, all right, I need an 11-6, someone sitting here needs to already know where to find that key instead of like counting up one by one. And then the other challenge is since these are not, um, these are not instruments that were built with a history of instrument making, they were kind of, uh, in some cases, experiments that worked or developments of experiments that didn't. Um, they all kind of respond differently to the act of tuning them. Some of them you turn the peg a little bit and it shoots right up like you would expect, and others you can kind of wind the string for 20 or 30 seconds before you get a change in pitch. It's just the nature of, uh, of, of instruments that were made by someone who was trying to figure out how to make instruments. Have you had any musicians participating who have, within traditional pitch context, absolute pitch, maybe based on, say, a 440A or something like that, who listen to maybe that and they think, gee whiz, that, that, that F is a little flat, or you know, this kind of thing. I haven't run into that with people in the ensemble, but I've heard it from audience members. Um, I don't know a lot about perfect pitch. My impression is that it's a, a, more an ability to memorize a pitch than it is a curse that you're stuck with only knowing 12 notes. Uh, so I imagine it would be possible to also learn and be comfortable with this system, but I can't speak about it with any expertise. Yes? During your performances, how many of these instruments and musicians would be playing? Well, we just had uh, three weeks ago on the Mini main stage, we did three evenings of a performance of Parch's Oedipus, which is his first uh, full-length 90-minute theater work. 
and that had uh, an orchestra of 16, a chorus of six, a cast of four, uh, and then a couple of speaking roles as well. And there were points where almost everyone was on stage and going, uh, really going crazy. But I mean, so. how many of the instruments are together on stage? So that, for that, we had almost this same set of instruments uh, on that stage. There's only two instruments out here now that were not part of that concert. And at one point, almost every one of them was playing at the same time. Uh, in his later theater works, they get even more crazy. His piece, uh, Revelation in the Courtyard Park, even has a marching band in it. So it really, can, he scaled up very quickly. Yes? So I was at that performance, and I noticed that there was also Western instruments in the orchestra, yeah. things like the, maybe a, a clarinet or a bass clarinet. Yeah. And are those instruments modified in any way, or do they play? <clears throat> do they have to modify their tunings so that they can fit in with this ensemble? Uh, yeah, it's the latter. So uh, in the case, it was clarinet, bass, clarinet, cello, and bass. Cello and bass have it much easier because you can just find the note on your fingerboard and it's OK. The clarinet and bass clarinet, it was a lot of pitch bending and finding tricky fingerings. And for some of the scenes, they had to pull out the barrel to get. Uh, there, there was one of the courses where everything was a quarter tone off from equal temperament. And so the only thing they could come up with was just pull the barrel way out. And then as soon as that's done, jam it back in real quick. Um, he, he wrote well for the instruments, but he didn't think very much about the tuning demands. Like his clarinet writing is really beautiful, but it's not written for, it's not practically written. Sure. All right, I'll jump ahead to a couple more things. Uh, since I was talking about this already, this instrument is the marimba oroika. Uh, it's four notes. What I'm really excited about here is that the wavelengths of these lowest bars don't really fit in the studio we rehearse in. So we can hardly even hear this tone when we're rehearsing, and we get nothing from this one, which is super. I cannot. Can you hear it from out there? I can barely hear it from here. Yeah. Yeah, there's no, nothing up here. But this one sounds amazing anywhere. Uh, so it's just a four note instrument, but because, oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, because it's so, so deep, it's got a lot of dramatic possibilities, even though uh, even if you play it with hands, because of how spread out it is, it's not really that agile of an instrument. You can't really go any faster than this kind of a thing because it's just there's too much ground to cover. Uh, but it's a really important instrument in all of his theater works. Again, since you saw Oedipus, you know it's like this ominous undercurrent in a lot of the most um, dramatic scenes of the piece. And then a couple times it really gets carried away with some rambunctious music. This is the lowest marimba in the world that I'm aware of. But I'm willing to be uh, re-educated if anyone knows about something that goes below 22 hertz. What are the other fundamentals? Uh, it's 22, 33, 4957. No. 4759? Uh, they're all quite low. I don't know. <laughs> I know 22 and 33, because I remember tuning them. These two were much easier. I didn't have to worry as much. Um, are those ports that we're seeing on this end of them? What is what? Yeah, are there ports on the boxes, or how are there? How is the sound being coupled to the world from the? Uh, yeah, so these are basically just cave resonators. Uh, this whole box, in this case, down to about here, and on the lowest one, nearly all the way down to the floor. Uh, those are just resonators that have an incredible volume in there, as opposed to the ideal resonators for this would be. Of course, vertical columns like these, but they would have to go, in the case of the lowest one, I think seven feet down below the stage, uh, which would make it really difficult to bring it anywhere. And it would probably explode out with the, the pressure. Are they sealed boxes, or are they all yes. the Yes. Oh. Yeah, oh, they're totally sealed. Yeah, they had, um, at one point down at the bottom, he had plungers for fine tuning. But ultimately, once he found where they needed, he just sealed them off. And what kind of wood is that? Uh, this is Sitka spruce as is the bass marimba here, which I'll get to uh, quickly next. This is just a slightly more, uh, ver well, actually, it's a lot more versatile. This instrument has 11 tones uh, spread out over just about two octaves. And the versatility on here comes from the variety of implements you can play with. Those are 
these are what he calls the small mallets. Uh, the larger ones get a little bit more fundamental out of the tone. You can again play with hands for what he calls a bongo sound. And then these sticks that you can use on the end uh, get a lot more attack and energy out of the bar. Uh, this instrument here is Cathara 2. These instruments both are up on risers. Um, they both have the same low pitch, this low C, the same bottom note as a cello. And uh, just so that the strings on this case or the, the bar, um, sorry, the resonator, has the correct uh, size for proper resonance for the ideal acoustic resonance, he built them up on these platforms instead of having to uh, compromise acoustically on what he was trying to do. So this instrument is Cathara II. Uh, it's set up each, it's got 72 strings uh, grouped in 12 sets of six. And each one of these sets of six corresponds to one of the 12 tonalities on his diamond marimba. Uh, the eight sets in the middle of the instrument are just tuned um, the same way you tune like a really small harp or a guitar or something, and then left is open strings. But the ones on the outside have these Pyrex rods attached, which enables you to uh, treat it kind of like a slide guitar that you can retune to any pitch you can imagine the whole way uh, up and down the, the soundboard. One of the things that got Parch interested in exploring other tuning systems in the first place was that he wanted to find a way to notate and accompany, accompany what the human voice does naturally when it speaks, which has nothing to do with rigidly placed steps within an octave, but it's about inflection and emotion. So he loved this thing. Uh, all of his string instruments are capable of these really fine gradations that you can sort of imagine would be the same way that a person might say something. Yeah. How does Parch notate that for the musician, the, the movement of the flexion? Yeah, this whole uh, ruler that we have down the side, that's also on the player's side. Uh, his instruments, this could be played from either side depending on the piece. And so it'll say uh, orange in this case. I don't know how clear that is, this orange circle up here. But it would say like orange 5-3. Uh, and so you put the orange rod at 5-3, and then you play your chord or your pitch there. Uh, so it's a lot of really precise stuff trying to sort of track all these ratios while you're probably also playing notes on the other side of the instrument as you move through. I played a couple notes on this previously, but this is the gourd tree. This is a fairly late instrument for Parch, um, and you can kind of tell that because it has this more whimsical shape to it. The chromolodians, the cathara, the bass marimba, the diamond marimba, they're all just pretty serious. They are what they are. Uh, the stand on this harmonic cannon is a little more colorful. That's a later instrument. The gourd tree itself, uh, just built on a eucalyptus branch, is also a later instrument. These are temple bells that he got as a gift from uh, percussionist Emil Richards, who had worked with him on a couple of Parch's um, recordings shortly after Parch moved to the uh, Los Angeles area. And so they're just tuned with these gourd resonators. Uh, and it adds a bit of sustain, but the bowls already kind of do really well on their own. Uh, it's not the same instrument as the cone gongs, but they're almost always handled by the same player. These are uh, nose cones from World War II era aircraft. This one's a little rattly today, but you get the idea. Uh, so they have these good bass tones with a lot of sustain, and then you can kind of pick out some higher overtones as well if you hit kind of part way up the, the gong. But the best sounds are, of course, these resonant tones at the bottom. So they're aluminum? Uh, I have no idea what metal they are. Probably. I would assume. I don't know who asked that, but I would assume aluminum. But I've not really thought about it. He might say in his book uh, he may not. But he found them in a salvage yard and just mounted them, and that was it. Uh, this instrument is the surrogate cathara. This is an instrument Parch built when he wrote a part for cathara two that turned out to be too difficult for one person to play. So he invented a second instrument and split the part between two players. Uh, it's laid out with eight strings on each of these two resonators, again with the Pyrex rods. <laughs> 
But what he discovered, uh, this being a horizontal layout of strings, he discovered that this is also a really good percussion instrument. And so wrote a lot of parts for this after he discovered this that involved the player uh, back and forth kind of on either side or of either instrument uh, striking, the, striking the strings, which he began to use on some of his other percussion or uh, other string instruments later on. But this was always the one he returned to for that kind of effect. The harmonic cannons, uh, which are these two and those two over there, and we have another one in the room somewhere, uh, these all are 44 strings just stretched over a resonator. And let me get this up here where we can see what's going on. You can see that each of these two has a different layout of bridges uh, that divide the string into various uh, proportions, and that's what determines the tuning of the instrument. So if there's no bridges on here at all, the strings are approximately tuned to an F, and then from there the bridges determine what the actual pitch is going to be. Uh, he, his cannons come in two types, either this one which has 44 strings of all the same thickness, or this one which has 22 of that thickness and then 22 uh, much thicker ones that are tuned an octave lower. And so just to give you a sense of the difference in tuning that uh, you can achieve with these bridges, this is set up for a piece called Two Studies on Ancient Greek Scales. Uh, and then this is set up for Castor and Pollux. What he often does with these instruments, and both of these tunings have this, uh, is that he'll have one hand playing chords while the other hand picks out a melody of some kind. So this one, we've got these two chords on the top with this scale, and then these two chords on the bottom with this scale. Here we have kind of a series of, oh, that's not, well, ignore that one. Of uh, this chord and this one, there are other chords on different orientations between the bridges here, and then a very uh, much more complicated melodic sequence available in the middle of this instrument. Uh, and almost every one of his compositions has a totally different bridge configuration. Uh, he will do anything from having two people on the same one harmonic cannon to having one person cover four harmonic cannons. Uh, it just depends on what did he need for the piece. The real unfortunate thing is that he only ever built five of these. So if you want to do the piece where you need one person to cover four cannons, it limits what else you can program on that same concert for these instruments. A couple of questions. One, Absolutely. are those placed perpendicularly always, or is there sometimes an angle? No, you can see, um, like this one's a really good example yeah. of yeah. one at an angle, just so that instead of having to have three individual bridges, for this note, this note, and this note, you can just have one in there to kind of cover the whole thing. And, and is it influenced maybe by a koto or something of that sort? Yeah, it's similar to other kind of uh, psalteries and zithers. It's, uh, I, he was really aware of uh, music of, of other cultures. When Parch grew up, uh, he was born to parents who had just fled the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, they had been in Oakland, California for about a year and a half before he was born, but he always claimed he was conceived in China. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of the sense of his, the way he liked to think about uh, music and his cultural awareness. So he was exposed to a lot of Chinese music. Uh, his mother would sing him Chinese lullabies and had some uh, traditional instruments. He moved a lot as a child uh, through the American Southwest, so he was exposed to Native American musics. Uh, and picked up some African music experience as well. So he was really aware of a lot of other cultures and what they were doing uh, with instruments and tunings. And I think that was one of the things that started him wondering if the piano was really all there was. But it certainly influenced a lot of his designs, um, as did his reading about uh, antiquity and ancient Greek. You can kind of see uh, the lyre shape kind of on his two cathars. They have that similar, um, like you would see on a seven string Greek cathara. Uh, he kind of co-opted that shape and that term for his own work. Yes? And I presume for every different piece you were, as far as the notation and music, show what all the bridge settings were? Yeah, it depends on uh, how specific he wanted to be about it. His earlier ones will have inch measurements from the nut, where do you set the bridge, and then what's the resulting tone going to be. And then by the time he got about 20 years into it, he just put the pitch and you have to figure it out yourself. Mm -hmm. 
But the idea is to keep the tension uniform, so it's not that hard to figure out where they go. It's just an interesting shift that he suddenly decided you can figure it out. It gets a little more problematic on ones like these where you need these and these and these to be in tune because now the bridge can only be at one precise spot. Um, his cloud chamber bowls, this instrument here, is a bit of a, an anomaly within this system. These are, uh, in this case, 14 cloud chamber bowls. They are parts of Pyrex carboys. If you see like this bit here and one of these at the bottom, they would be one bottle. And so you cut them, and if you don't break one half or the other while you cut them, you end up with two bowls. Uh, over the period of his, his work with this instrument, uh, they would break several times. And every time, his answer was always, make another one and then rewrite all the music. Uh, the problem that Parch had, and what makes it so interesting in his system, is that he was never able to tune them precisely. He would cut them. If he needed a higher pitch, he'd cut it a little smaller. If he needed a medium pitch, he'd cut it sort of in the middle. Uh, but he was never able to actu uh, accurately tune them because he didn't have access to a water-cooled grinder or something like that, which would have cost, I, I assume today, it's still around $20,000 or so. So for him, who uh, was mostly homeless and often relied on people to sort of offer him housing or, or something like that. It was just out of the question. But uh, it's a really beautiful tone. A really complicated overtone spectrum. Uh, and to make matters even more complicated, those are the tones that you can sort of determine, even though Parch never tuned them uh, specifically. You can kind of, again, cut it higher or lower to make a higher or lower tone. But there are additional notes available on the tops, which have nothing to do with the note that you've cut the bottom of the bowl at. It's determined when Pyrex makes this thing. And to my knowledge, they haven't started tuning their carboys yet. So you just end up with what you get. So it makes it very difficult when one of these would break. Um, and we still have seven of Parcher's originals on this set, any of the ones with this paint on. Uh, I think these three, four, five, six, seven are still original. So that's pretty good for him having the last ones he made were somewhere in the 70s. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that they can break um, even if they're being played properly and respectfully just because you're hitting a piece of glass with a mallet and eventually it's going to happen. But if you're playing it carefully, it shouldn't break that often. And so we've been lucky in the last four or five years that I've been in charge of the ensemble that that has not happened yet. But it is an interesting anomaly that one of his, what's that? You have to disassemble the whole thing to move it? Or? Almost everything in here has to be disassembled to move, yeah. Okay. Uh, most of these don't fit through a standard doorway. The organs fit, that's maybe about it, the harmonic cannons. Uh, the gourd tree would fit. But the cathara has to be taken apart. The bass room has to be taken apart. The Eureka has to go out the door one bar at a time. Uh, all of these get unhung, and the frame gets disassembled. Everything, uh, that's why we try to back up, stack up a bunch of concerts next to each other. If we had a concert, and then we were away for a week and came back for another one, we lose a lot of time in, in transit. In general, how fragile are these? These are old. These are old. The oldest one, the adapted viola, uh, was built, was adapted in 1931. Um, I don't know when the viola itself is from. This chromolodeon, the harmonium itself, was built in 1901, and he adapted it later. This is an instrument I'm not very good at. Uh, I have no string background. Maybe you want to give it a try yourself. But uh, the idea with this, if you take a look at the fingerboard, it's got all of these little uh, metal brads lying next to the string. So they're not frets. They don't actually stop the string, but it's something for your finger to sort of recognize as you're sliding around. Uh, in this case, it marks off 29 points in his scale. And so, I mean, it sounds the same as any other string instrument might. Um, but you have access to sort of this guide to help you find one tone to the next, to the next, to the next. Pardon? Yeah, that was the main adaptation. Uh, so this instrument also has the same low G as its fundamental. 
So he put on a slightly, he, he took a cello neck, ground it down, attached it to a viola body. Uh, and so that's where this instrument comes from. <laughs> the other really interesting thing about it, um, I don't know if this is going to be super visible, but if you see uh, under our 9-8 string, the A string, there's this little extra wooden piece. Uh, this is a tooth that raises this string. If you take it out, which I don't want to do right now because I need it uh, for a concert tomorrow, although if you're at the concert tomorrow, you'll see uh, Luke Fitzpatrick do this. This comes out and the bridge is completely flat, which allows you to play sustained triple stops. So that's the other interesting thing that this instrument is capable of. Uh, but th so this, and my point was that this is one of his oldest instruments, uh, and it's actually in really good shape. The things that are fragile in here, more often than not, are not uh, the important parts of the instrument. Like the music stands on some of these instruments are very thin sheets of plywood or plexiglass. And while you don't want them to break, if they do, it's not as bad as a soundboard splitting or something because of humidity. When you, if somebody were to remove that part so that you could play several strings simultaneously, yeah. do they loosen the bow or do they use the same twerk style bow? Or? Yeah, the same bow works because the three strings are then on the same plane. Um, okay. So you just kind of detune the string, pop that out, and tune it back up. It takes a couple of minutes and then it should be fine. Three strings and that are flat so they play chords like that. Yeah, it's that same kind of philosophy. Uh, these two are also fairly old on his instrument scale, and the only things I believe I didn't get to yet. These are his adapted guitars. Uh, this is adapted guitar one, which uh, took several forms. He was really interested in writing for voice and guitar and tried a few different ways of accomplishing that. Uh, his first one was that he took this same guitar uh, body and he removed all the frets and replaced them with frets tuned to specific stops in his scale. Um, but he found that they didn't really work that clearly, so he took those out, replaced them with uh, much taller frets so that he could get really clean stops on the strings, but that really limited the number of frets that he could have. So ultimately, he just went with an open uh, slide. And so this guitar now, he has it all tuned to six strings at the same G, and you just play with the slide to different stops along the way. Uh, a slightly more complicated version of that same idea is Adapted Guitar 2, which is a 10-string Hawaiian-style guitar. Uh, again, played with a slide, but instead of being six strings tuned to the same pitch, we have this more complicated harmony. So this is the U-tonality tuning for this instrument, the minor tuning. What I love about this guitar is that if you see, we have these two wing nuts up here on the headstock. And if you just pop the strings underneath each one, you end up in the major tuning. So you can switch back and forth in the middle of a piece in a matter of a couple of seconds. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Do your, do your mus musicians specialize in a particular instrument, or do they? One or two, or is there? I think it really varies on personality type. Um, the people who come in here as percussionists, of course, are more drawn to the percussion instruments than the others. And uh, if you come in as a keyboard player, that's obviously the easiest way to enter. But uh, some people really get into it and get excited about getting their hands on as many instruments as they can. That was my approach to it as an undergrad uh, a while ago, 15 years ago. Um, but other people come in here and they really want to be the best diamond marimba player or something. And I think there's advantages to both ways of approaching it. Uh, where I get players is from anyone who wants to be one. So this ensemble is about maybe 40% students, 30% faculty, 30% community members. And I think it's a pretty cool balance, actually, for it to be that way. Students, the downside is that as soon as they get really fluent in the system, they move on to some other school, and I lose them. Uh, but with people, community people around and, and faculty, we're able to sort of build a longer, um, get to more complicated parts and everyone can kind of have this opportunity of, okay, I feel really good about this instrument, let me try something else. Other questions? Yeah. So if you're gonna be a player, then what do you practice on? I mean, this is the set of instruments. <laughs> the biggest problem that I have, yeah. The instruments are in our studio in the music building and if you wanna practice, your choices are to come there or build your own. <laughs> and no one's taken plan B yet. Is that a pickup on the sound? 
Yeah, we've got a pickup on both of these guitars. Um, he tried pickups on other of his instruments, but it, they didn't really work as well. But uh, mo almost all of his string instruments and both of his organs really benefit from amplification in performance, especially when they're up against some of his crazy percussion writing. <laughs> To what extent were these instruments utilized, or have they, in, uh, in film? Uh, they were used, I think all of his film music was for Madeline Turlow. He did at least three projects with her. I don't think he did anything with anyone else. And then she recorded a couple of projects, uh, a couple of his theater projects. There was actually one other, Stephen Puglio, uh, he also did work with. Uh, he preferred since about 10 years into his compositional uh, activity, his, his kind of consistent activity, that his music was not a standalone piece, that it was either music with film, music with dance, music with theater, uh, that there was some other element to it, because he didn't like this idea of uh, sort of specialization, where the orchestra plays their music and then that's it, or the actors act and then that's it. He liked this idea where uh, again, if you were at our show for Oedipus or if you're able to come uh, this Friday, we're doing Castor and Pollux with dance. He liked this idea of at least having the instruments and the cast being on the same stage uh, so that the dancers can enter through the instruments or come around the outside of them and that the cast can enter through uh, the ensemble. And with his films, um, more often than not, it's a, a blend of film shots of whatever the, the film is about back to shots of players at the instruments, because for him it was very important that both were represented. He, he liked the term ritual, as though these elements all were intended to be together and to be presented as one. Uh, we'll take this, and then I think this seems like a good time for a short break. Yes? Has anybody ever sampled these instruments? It has not been done. <laughs> if the instruments are sampled, uh, the original music might, the, the necessity of having the actual instruments in performance might be uh, overlooked. And so a synthesized performance of one of these pieces would be absolutely the opposite of where Parch was heading. Everything was, these are the only set of instruments you need, my players, you need to be watching what I'm physically making them do, which is kind of unusual. So there's a fear that that would be um, lost, I guess. If, Exactly. There's, I mean, there's a huge benefit to it, absolutely, but it's, yeah, it, there's also a, a, a concern there. It, should do it, it could open up a whole new thing of use. It would change a lot of things, yeah. I mean, there was also reluctance when uh, sets of replicas were being made, and yet there's a set of uh, almost the same amount of instruments we have out here, a few fewer than that uh, of replicas in Los Angeles. There's a full set of replicas in Cologne, Germany, and a handful of people have made three or four others so they can play some of his earlier music. So as much as that was a concern, it's still happening. So this seems like, I'm sorry, I just said to do a break, but we can talk, we can talk on the, well, all right, let's go. Has there been any attempt to do spectral analysis of the instruments that sound? Some of the sounds, yeah, the cloud chamber bowls. Uh, I don't have any of them out, but his bamboo instruments have been analyzed um, probably more in depth than any of the others because it's a very weird, decay on the attack. They're, so, they're such a crisp sound. Um, but on the other hand, some of his other things, a plucked string on a resonating box, you could analyze any other zither and get something close. So I don't know that a ton of work has been done on his guitars or organs or cannons. Yes? So you mentioned that um, the fundamental load in all of these is uh, low G, which is basically the frequency of his voice. If you have the perspective that maybe it was a personal thing, like Yeah, I don't know that he was opposed to someone else taking it on. Uh, I think, well, certainly early it was a practical matter of if I don't have to teach anyone else this system, it's a lot easier. So his earliest pieces were for himself uh, doing voice and adapted viola, and then his next set of pieces were himself doing voice and adapted guitar. So it wasn't until he started uh, wanting to add female voices that he even had to worry about other people. Uh, so I think that was sort of the genesis of everything, and then once you're in that mode, it's a little bit, um, it's hard to make too many changes to it. But I know that there was a point where uh, he was collaborating with composer uh, Ben Johnston on writing a piece together. Uh, it didn't really work out, but 
I know that that was uh, an experiment that he tried. So I don't think he was opposed to other people working with his instruments. I think for him it was more that he didn't want other people doing it just to do it. He only wanted other people to do it if it actually meant something to them. Otherwise, they should be doing whatever means something to them instead of trying his thing. But let's take a, a quick break. Thank you.